I was living my life like everyone else, married to a wonderful man, and have two amazing young men I'm proud of who went to Lakota West. I remember those days when I used to take my kids to their school on rainy days, to their soccer practices, roller hockey, and swimming lessons. I'm a clinical pharmacist from Assyrian descent. I, I work at a hospital in the area and, we're, and, and, and take care of my patients. And when I go back home, I take care of my family, go out for dinners, visit my friends, go on vacations and travel every now and then. I was living my life like everyone else until the Syrian crisis began in 2011. How is it possible that people like you and I, minding our own lives peacefully, are being killed in cold blood? It was difficult to see family members and old friends in Syria suffering at the hands of their own government. To see buildings, neighborhoods, streets I knew collapsing to ruins by government airstrikes. to see families displaced from their own homes, to see children crying. It was hurting me to see all that suffering, and I'm here in my home, sitting on my couch and trying to choose, to choose which carpet would work best and doing nothing about the suffering. As many people fled to, to the borders with Turkey. I decided to go to, 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 to Turkey and see what I could do. I found a medical relief organization that was providing medical aid to, to displaced Syrians, to refugee Syrians in, in Turkey. I stepped in and didn't hesitate for a minute and helped in every way I could. Shortly after helping with pharmacy inventory, I was asked by the organization to lead their medical mission in Syria and Turkey. I didn't hesitate for a minute. This became my new mission in life, but it was not easy. One of the memories ingrained in my mind is this young mother sobbing over the body of her dead son. I was inside at our emergency hospital in northern Syria, when suddenly I heard a strong thud. It was again, one of those bombs that hit nearby village. Suddenly cars with wounded women, children, and men were flooding to the hospital, and I was there at the corner of the emergency department watching what's going on. I was watching nurses and doctors, like Dr. Juma, who was a vascular surgeon, rushing to the injured to help as much as they could. Over 25 victims were in the, in the ER. On, on the beds, on the floor, blood was everywhere. And there, I saw that young mother sobbing and crying over her four-year-old son. He was dead. And at the same time, she was trying to reach out to her two-year-old daughter, who, who was severely injured, and begging the doctors to save her only girl. I remember Hanin, a beautiful nine-year-old girl at our post-op care center in Turkey. A few months back, she was having breakfast with her family at home when suddenly a bomb struck their neighborhood. She saw her dad and younger brother dying in front of her eyes, but she couldn't do anything. Shortly, she figured that she couldn't move herself. She was hit badly. I will never forget Hanin and the look in her eyes. Hanin, the young mother who lost her son, and many other victims I saw, the difficulties I faced and the traumas I witnessed gave me the courage, strength, and motivation to continue my mission and do my best. As days went and months elapsed, I continued volunteering for this great organization, USSM, 
supervising their medical mission in Syria and Turkey. This mission that started from the basement full of medications grew and became one of the major medical relief organizations working in Syria, providing medical aid and, 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 and services to over a million victims. I oversaw the establishment of that emergency hospital in northern Syria, which now serves over 20,000 patients a month. I had hundreds of meetings with donors and international aid organizations. I was doing things I would never imagine that I could do in my entire life. So focused on helping the victims of war in Syria, I used to feel that I was not doing enough for my family. But I didn't realize the inspiration that my work gave them. My older son on your left, Abdurrahman Trabulsi, accompanied me on, my, on several times of my mission. This inspired him to change his career track and pursue his degree in medicine. He also established a student organization at OSU that called Refuge to help refugee students to integrate easily into the education system which he later incorporated, became a nonprofit organization. My younger son, Ma'moon, on your right, he grew very responsible and caring at an early age. I remember when he cracked his phone, and that was after he went with me, I think early 2012, to Turkey. And I wanted to buy him a new phone, like I always did, but he said, Mama, my phone is working. And when it stops working, I'll get a new one. Many people don't even have a phone to use. He, he grew very responsible at, his, at home and school. And as he entered college in OSU, he told me, I want to have a career in life that I could help other, peoples who are in, who are other people who are in need and be part of their daily lives. As I started to pay more attention, I realized that the impact of my work went far beyond the people I was directly helping. My colleagues at work will come to me and ask me how they could help. My friends, my neighbors, will check on my family when I was away. Many people, young men and women, in my small Muslim community at, and at the community at large, will come to me and ask me about the work I'm doing. And many times I don't know, I don't even know their names. Many colleges ask me to give lectures to their students about the Syrian crisis and the medical relief work in Syria. The effect went beyond what I would ever imagine and continued to ripple beyond whatever, whatever I would dream of. One day in 2015, I met Asma. A beautiful young lady at our, at our post-op care center in Turkey, the same one that I met Hanin. She, she was severely injured after a bomb that struck their, her hometown in northern Syria. She told me her story and how she lost everything in her life because of the war in Syria, including her education. She was supposed to be graduating from high school that year but she didn't even finish her ninth grade as she didn't have access to any school. I remember Asma and the beautiful smile on her face that masked her deep sadness and misery. She asked me about my profession and what I do in life and when I told her I'm a pharmacist, her smile dissipated quickly and her tears ran down on her cheeks and said, I was supposed to graduate from high school this year. I wish I could continue my education, fulfill my dreams, but there's nothing I could do. After a brief silence that I felt it will never end, she asked me this question. You have a life, a family, and work as a pharmacist back home. What made you come here to Turkey and leave everything behind you. 
I was speechless. She didn't know what to say. Then I looked at her and said, I am here because of you, because of people like you who inspire me to do what I'm doing, who make my life and work meaningful. If I can't share my life with you, what significance it has. Then I followed, one day you're gonna be doing what I'm doing today and even more, and you'll be proud of yourself. She looked at me with her eyes shining again and a big smile on her face and said, would I be able to continue my education? I said, yes, but it's up to you. Do your best and put your heart into it. And think of others and not only yourself. And you'll see how doors will open in front of your eyes. She smiled and hugged me and promised that she'll do her best and finish her education, whatever it takes, and never give up. Now, it's up to you to help Esma and others like her fulfill their dreams and live to their potential. It's up to you to think of others and not only yourself. It's up to you to share your talents, your gifts, and your abilities to make this world a better place. Now I sit down and think of how my life was transformed, of how my priorities were changed, and what it means to create a change. My intention was not to establish a great organization, nor inspire my community or the people around me. My intention was to do my best and put all my heart into it, and what comes from our hearts penetrates the hearts of those around us and starts a ripple that can break down walls, save lives, and put a smile on the face of a stranger halfway across the world. Thank you.